Um, for those of you who haven't uh, tuned into these before today, uh, the earlier ones today, I'm Marvin Brown. I work for the National Association of State Foresters Forest Resource Management Committee. And this is the last of the four sessions that have been put together by my committee, by Rick Cantrell's uh, Forest Markets Committee, and by Mike Beacom's uh, NACD Forest Resource Policy Group. Uh, reminder that if you have questions, please put them in the chat room and we'll try to keep track of that. If you're interested in receiving SAF CFE credits, uh, Mike will be turning in names of attendees uh, after this is over so that you can do that. And with that, I will jump right into introducing our speaker. Uh, the topic is understanding what motivates woodland owners. And um, I thought this would be pretty and a lot of push about tree planting as a climate solution and some very ambitious goals being placed out there about how many acres we could plant and what it would do. And, and Whitney talked a little bit about that at the last session. But the, you know, for that to happen, a lot of that's gonna have to take place on private land. And so the question becomes, what's gonna motivate those private landowners to actually substantially increase tree planting? And that's where Dr. Brett Butler comes in. He's the research forester with the U.S. Forest Service. He is a national and international expert on family forest ownership who has offered over 100 articles and reports on this topic. For over 20 years, he has been a research forester with the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station Inventory and Analysis Program, and he is an adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He coordinates the National Woodland Owner Survey, co-directs the Family Forest Research Center, a joint project between the Forest Service and the University of Massachusetts, and co-leads the Tools for Engaging Landowners Effectively Initiative. And if you don't know, uh, Society of American Public uh, Foresters just recently published this book about woodland owners that Brett published. So with that, Brett, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very kindly, Marvin. And I did not pay for that um, advertisement. <laughs> Appreciate it and appreciate the, the general introduction. And I appreciate the opportunity to be in front and to be in front of all of you today and share some ideas that I have today about this very important and as Marvin was saying, very timely topic. Um, it is exciting and challenging to be at the end of a number of great speakers. And I'll try to tie in at least some of what I'm gonna be presenting to some of the earlier excellent presentations that were being given. Okay, so the general topic that was handed to me was related to landowners' attitudes towards um, afforestation. And that's primarily what I'm gonna be talking about, but I wanna make sure that I couch this in a sort of, in a little bit broader of a, of a context. And so, and I also wanna just make sure that I am being cognizant about what, my, what I can potentially add to this. I am not a policy person. I will not um, determine policy. Hopefully the work that we're doing will help inform policy. I am not a civil culturalist. So I'm not gonna be suggesting that this management technique over this management technique will create the greatest amount of carbon sequestration. There are other experts out there who will provide that information. Where my expertise comes in is understanding private landowners, particularly family forest owners the nearly 10 million people who own over a third of the forest land across the United States. When I think of carbon storage, I basically divide it into these three categories. And we can go back and forth. There are subcategories we can collapse and expand as we see fit. But keeping forests as forest, that's obviously a huge one. Uh, afforestation, given to what Marvin was talking about, that is one of the major pushes that we are talking about nowadays. And I will devote a fair amount of my time to that specific topic. And then enhanced forest management is another one of those topics. Again, what I would like to talk about is how landowners are perceiving this information. The reason that it's important, and maybe this is, and hopefully this is known information, we know it uh, at least at a deeper level, but I just wanna make sure that it is on the forefront, why this is important in terms of landowners. It's land tenure issues. Who owns the land? Who's gonna determine what's gonna happen with it in the future? Land tenure is a legal set of rights, legal and um, social set of rights, um, like basically legacy and how society sees these about the land. What do the landowners own? What do they have control over? There's a set 
of criteria that we look at when we're looking at land tenure. And this is really important when we start thinking about carbon sequestration in particular. Who owns the trees? Who owns the land that's underneath those trees? Is really important for determining how these programs will be put forth. Hopefully most people understand general forest ownership, or at least people on this call hopefully do, uh, across the United States. But if not, I offer up this map. And hopefully it's clear that one, we have a lot of forest and we are blessed with a lot of forest in the United States. We have a lot more forest now than we did 100 years ago. Overall, the forest ownership trends are fairly stable. Granted, there are some places where we are losing, but there are also some places where we are gaining forest. Hopefully from this map, it's also obvious that a majority of the land, over half of the forest land is privately owned. And of that, nearly two thirds is owned by families and individuals. So again, as I was mentioning before, collectively families and individuals, they own hundreds of millions of acres across the United States. And particularly once we start looking across the Eastern United States, they own a plurality of this land that we're talking about. Here I'm talking about forest landowners. And for some of these conversations, we need to be talking about a broader group of people, landowners in general. And sometimes these are the same people, sometimes they're not. We have an issue, particularly I do, I think many of us in the forestry realm do. When we think about landowners, we think of the forested part of their land. And we need to expand that because for a lot of these activities that we're talking about, particularly these afforestation activities, those might be different landowners or those might be landowners who will think about that part of their land differently. Unfortunately, most of the land, most of the data that I'm gonna be sharing today is about the forested part of the land. When I get to the end, I'll talk about next steps. And this is one of those places where I really think we need to go. And I will be proposing, and I have proposed something I call an all land survey or all landowner survey, so that we can start reaching out, um, reaching out beyond just the forested piece. The forest and keeping the forest as forest is obviously hugely important, but we need to be thinking about these other pieces as well. I mentioned before that the overall forest trends are fairly solid across the United States and they are, but we are seeing some interesting dynamics and for some ownership groups, some difficult dynamics that we're seeing. Over the last 10 or 20 years, we have been seeing a shift in a decrease in what we'll sometimes call non-industrial, sometimes called non-corporate, in general, what we'll call family forest lands. Um, we are seeing a decrease in the acreages that is in that category. Some of those lands are being converted over to corporate lands. And some of that is really a sort of shell game because they're acting the same. They converted over to an LLC or an LLP. Cool. Those are still forests. They're still being managed as forests. There is just some internal accounting we within the Forest Service are trying to catch up to. And we're, we're working on it, but it's hard. Uh, but then there is also a certain percentage of that land that is going out of forest land, going to develop land, going to ag land. And it's really that ag land piece that is hugely important here, particularly when we're talking about afforestation. And it's gonna be a lot of those marginal lands that are currently pasture land that will be the lowest hanging fruit for the afforestation efforts that we are talking about. And granted, it needs to be um, marginal pasture land, or I guess it doesn't need to be marginal, but um, ideally land that is non-forested, usually ag, um, in areas that are capable of naturally growing trees. So it just can be a lot easier. We're not converting wrong forest, wrong land types to forest land. Um, again, that is gonna be a topic for somebody who is more on the ecological side of things. My expertise is on the social side of things. The other part of the social side of things is the dynamics that we're looking at. So before I was showing that we have some overall stable trends in a couple of categories, some decreasing and increasing in other categories, but overall, there's also this underlying complexity. This is what we call a Sankey chart, or some people call it a spaghetti chart um, for obvious reasons. And we can see there's a lot of dynamic, and this is just dynamics between ownership categories. Within all of the ownership categories, there can be a lot of dynamics happening there. So family selling to families, some of that selling, some of that transferring to the next generation. Um, within corporations, uh, we'll see a fair amount of land changing hands as well. One of the reasons that these dynamics are really important because at these points of transfer, 
that's going to be one of the points when we think about what our objectives going to change, how our management activity is going to change. And so we're going to probably want to be concentrating on some of those as I'm trying to depict in this diagram right here. Family forest owners and people in general are complex, um, hugely complex. And so some days we think about it, it's like, oh man, this is too much. Um, they have a lot going on in their plates, they do. Um, we in forestry, it's a complex story and it is, but how can we start to simplify this? And so given what some of the earlier conversations in this webinar series were, that's part of it is simplifying the messaging. Here, I'm not necessarily talking about messaging, but simplifying the system, simplifying what we're trying to look at and how we can influence it from a perspective of the forestry community. For an individual landowner, the points of purchase and sale, those are critical as I was suggesting before. And so can we think through as a larger community, what can we be doing to influence those um, decisions or at least hopefully informing those? is what I think is really important. So there's those points. What about some other points? Uh, one example as depicted here is harvesting. And so obviously that's gonna be a hugely important point for a lot of landowners. Not all landowners will harvest and that's fine as well. Some will harvest many times, some will harvest only once. And so understanding who is doing it when and being able to understand what some of those issues are, what some of those factors are that are influencing them can be really important. So here I'm depicting some of those, their constraints, their norms, their attitudes. That's going to what that's going to be some of the factors that are influencing their decision whether or not to harvest. And what happens with all of these decisions, and this comes from something called behavioral change theory that I'll get into in a few minutes, is we go through a cycle. First off, we may not even know that this is an option. We may not know that harvesting is something that I can do with my woods. Granted, all of us here are probably from the forestry world and we realize this is something that's normal, happens on a regular basis. A lot of the general public doesn't necessarily understand that or a lot of landowners don't. So they're in the pre-contemplation stage. Then once they realize, ah, this is an option. And so we wanna think about that. Have they never thought about that? Okay, let's provide the right information. Then once we can get them to start thinking about it, what is the information that we wanna provide? There will be some people who realize this is an option. They'll say, not for me, I don't wanna be murdering trees. Very often when they start using that terminology, it's like, okay, probably not right for you. And that's fine. There's over 10 million family forest owners and a lot of them are gonna be changing hands um, sometime in the not too distant future. So let's go on to folks who are what we call prime prospects, people who um, are more inclined for some of these activities. And so then we can figure out, okay, this is something that may be right for them. How can we help them prepare for these activities? They're gonna to wanna to understand who can I talk to? What are my resources? With private lands and given land tenure, we always wanna be remembering this is their lands. And so I think it is great for the larger community to be providing them with information about what their options are, what the relative pros and cons are, but all within the context that these are private lands. And in the United States, private lands are sacrosanct. We want to make sure that we are, um, you know, realizing that and hopefully sharing values with them, what's important to them and us. And when those unite, those are some of the things that will be really powerful moving forward. So sometimes when we have these really complex ideas, it can be overwhelming. So systems theory, as again, as I'm presenting here, is one way to help deduce that. The other piece that I think is really important about this is to think about where forests are in the minds of most landowners. For most landowners, as my colleague and my mentor, Dave Kittredge put it, their forests are running in the background. Their forests are green, their forests look healthy. Why worry about it? I don't have to do anything with it. For a lot of landowners, that's appropriate and that's fine. Um, but you know, we have to realize that for a lot of landowners, that's where they are. But at some point, a lot of these people will harvest. Um, and so how can we get to them at that right time or make sure they have the right information uh, is what is really important. Also really important is segmenting landowners. I'll get into this a little bit more as well. Uh, I mentioned that there's some landowners who will harvest only once. That's one segment. There are also some landowners who are harvesting on a regular basis. They are extremely active landowners. 
And these people are different than some of the other landowners who are out there. They understand what the cost share programs are. They understand what the tax um, programs are, or at least they're gonna be much more amenable to them if we provide them with that information. So thinking about the different types of landowners who are out there, providing information in the right time, in the right manner for these people is really critical. So what I was asked to talk about is a, for me, a fairly broad area. There's a lot of research that's out there that is looking at landowners and carbon programs sort of generally writ. And so I went through a database that I have. I have a database of probably about 7,000 citations um, and did a couple of keyword searches and looked for stuff that was related to carbon programs. Came up with over 40 articles. So a fair amount, not huge, but a fair amount. Most of these are looking at various offset markets that are available. So people who have existing forest land, um, how are they gonna be able to partake in some of these programs? Granted, a lot of the literature is now somewhat dated. Uh, I am summarizing below two of the more recent ones, but there are new programs that are out there that we don't know what the receptivity of landowners will be towards these. But given what the state of the knowledge was, when this work was done that I'm showing below in 2017, we have a good place to start. There's still a lot more we need to learn. Um, and these are just two, but they are representative of, I think the broader set of literature about this topic that's out there. And again, the more recent ones that are available. There's a couple more recent ones, but um, these I think are you know good for um, what I'm trying to portray here. As I was mentioning before, segmentation is really important. And so we have different types of landowners. They're not homogenous. And so depending on what the program is that we are interested in, how can we segment landowners? Before Ray was talking about segmenting the general population and she was talking about targeting uh, parts of the general population between 18 and 34. That's really cool for what she's doing. For family forest owners, not the best target audience. Uh, the average age of landowners is somewhere around 65 years. And so understanding who these people are um, and then understanding that for a lot of these programs, they, most of these landowners either don't, aren't aware that they exist or they have a poor understanding about what the features are of these programs. A lot of these are fairly complex and that might be necessary, but we have to also figure out how to convey these in a simple enough manner to get the landowners interested enough to bring in the expertise, the experts, to help them um, walk through the process. Uh, most landowners will not be able to do this themselves. And there are a number of challenges with the existing programs that are out there. Size of forest holdings is a big one. If you own less than, let's say 5,000 acres, a lot of the existing programs are not a great fit for you. Um, the costs are just too high. The requirements are too high for that return on investment. Granted, there are a number of programs outright out there right now who are trying to address this issue, which is fantastic. Um, and we'll see what their success rates are. And I'm sure we're going to have to tweak some of this, but it's a continual learning process. But given the state of the knowledge, at least when this work was published in 2017, the requirements for most landowners were non-starters. Um, you know, having, having to lock up their land for that amount of time. And given the amount of money that these programs are offering, it's like, no, this makes no sense for the people that were being um, looked at. And I should mention that the um, that first work that I'm mentioning by Aaron Kelly was out in California, uh, and that work by Kanal et al. was down in the South. Um, the other thing that was interesting is how this relates to climate change. And as before we were talking about messaging, we might want to think about how we are messaging some of these carbon programs. Yes, for a lot of program, for a lot of landowners, climate change will be an important factor not all landowners. And for most landowners, it's probably not the primary factor that they're thinking about when they are making decisions about their land. And so we should be thinking about this as we are moving forward. Aforestation was the specific piece that I was asked to talk about. And I'll talk about it as much as I can, but unfortunately there is very little information that's out there. Um, this Ryan and O'Donoghue paper, you know, I think they put it pretty, pretty succinctly. 
Um, granted, that's 2019. That's still pretty recent. Um, there is, but I was able to find at least one additional citation since there. So we are moving forward. But there's just not a lot of information that is looking at the reasons why people are aforesting, why an individual is doing it. There is a lot of information out there from the econometric literature looking at what we call aggregate models. Why are we seeing an increase in forest land and a decrease in cropland or pasture land in this county? There's lots of great information out there about that. So it's not really macroeconomics, but it's not micro microeconomics, not that individual type of stuff that we're often looking at to understand why people are doing it. At that broader level, you know, they're looking at population density. They're looking at issues related to um, the value of the land. What's the return? Uh, what's the land rent value for a lot of that? And there's a lot of great research out there. It's really rich. Um, so that's really good, but nothing about individual landowners decisions. That's really lacking from the literature. The one piece that I was able to find came from Canada um, and it is fairly recent. And it's very interesting, I thought, and very telling um, looking at why people would be potentially interested in aforesting their land. This is Canada. It will be a little different from the United States. And don't worry, this is Eastern Canada. It is private land, uh, what we're talking about. So it's not crown land. That'd be something different. But this is private land. They do have lots of that over in the maritime provinces. Why are people interested in doing this? And you can see that the primary reasons are related to wildlife. They're related to nature protection type of things. And so understanding this from their motivational perspective can be really important when we are um, trying to get them interested in these programs. And obviously we will always be honest, but we wanna make sure that we are leading with the best foot. All of us are interested in wildlife. All of us are interested in carbon. And so that's all great. But you know, if it is wildlife that is most important to them, let's lead with that piece. And we'll be able to attract a lot more people with that. You can see what some of the other factors are that they were interested in. And one thing that's interesting on this one in particular, I think, is the one related to income. That one kind of tanked, um, according to this research that was being done up in Canada. So leading with a economic um, perspective, at least for most landowners, is not going to be the way to do it. That being said, maybe we need to be doing more segmenting. And maybe it is actually that 10% of landowners, it's only 10%, but maybe they have enough land and maybe they're gonna be the ones who are more likely to actually do that work. And so we wanna look at this a number of different ways. Again, segment, 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 um, and think about who's gonna be most likely to take these actions. Um, how many people do we want to get involved? Um, how, yeah, so how many acres are we looking? That's going to be really important moving forward. Where is it? What are their attitudes? And we have a lot of information that we can be throwing at this. In the United States, we do have a program that's been doing this for a long time that has been doing afforestation, the CRP or Conservation Reserve Program. It's been around for a long time and it has been hugely successful. Um, you know, just millions and millions of acres that have been aforested from this. Um, traditionally with CRP, it was related to soil, water, and wildlife conservation. Um, initially in the authorizing legislation, nothing about climate change, but that has recently been amended. And so if you go onto the CRP website now, they are starting to talk more about climate change there as well. Um, and it definitely does have a, a role there. This is for taking out marginal, marginally productive um, ag land that has a number of different values. And there's a rubric that you can go through to figure out which lands are most likely to be most competitive for CRP um, enrollment and different enrol enrollment processes, but which ones will be most competitive. And so, you know, there's a number of different factors there, but because these are agricultural lands, you know, a lot of this is gonna be related to commodity prices. And that's one thing that we've been seeing we do see that these programs are being, what we call, do have additivity. This is a true change in behaviors in landowners. They would not have taken these lands out of um, cropland or out of pasture land if this program did not exist. That being said, if there's a change in commodity prices, we also see that there is a relatively 
um, high amount of elasticity where they will take some of these lands back out. Depends on the prices, depends on where they are, but we need to be thinking about that. Um, most of the studies of CRP are that broader sort of economic type of stuff, looking at the aggregate models. Um, I have a few statistics on the bottom that are looking at individual attitudes. And it's interesting there where again, wildlife is the one that comes out on top. So we're starting to see a little bit of a theme. We do see financial much higher than in that Canadian example. But again, this is what CRP is designed for. That makes sense. And then we can see environmental coming in a, a quick um, or close third. And if you add in the environmental and the wildlife, that's over half of the people whose primary objectives enrolling in CRP are related to non-financial objectives. I think that's very interesting and very telling. Another piece that we may wanna think about is reforestation. And you know, with all of us, hopefully we are good on the differences between these definitions. And I believe that um, our previous speakers were doing a nice job of talking about the differences and we're talking about forests. We need to talk about these differently. Reforestation, meaning we did some sort of harvest and we are gonna go back in and replant that. Granted, across a lot of the United States, we may not need to reforest. It just happens naturally in my neck of the woods. I'm based out of Amherst, Massachusetts. We don't do a lot of planting. You cut down trees, you let anything be vacant for any amount of time, we got trees. They come back in, no problems. May not be the mix you want, but we got trees. So we don't do a lot of planting here, but other places we do. Uh, I think that this article from Ruseva et al. in 2015 is a nice example. There's a few others out there that I could have highlighted, but I chose this one. Uh, looking at a slightly different part of the country, this one's in the Midwest. In particular, this was done in Southern Indiana. Um, they did find that cost share can be effective for reforestation among a certain segment of owners. So again, we're seeing the segmentation piece come through really strong. And so for people who are inclined to do this, who are inclined to reforce, inclined to be receptive to cost share, it is effective. But that can be a relatively small segment. Is it big enough? Depends on what you want to do. So we need to be thinking about that. Of those people who are inclined towards cost sharing and doing reforesting, we can see what some of the attributes are of people who are more likely to enroll. They tended, at least in this study, to be younger, college educated and smaller parcels. So with the smaller parcels, then we have to be starting to think about, well, that's fine, but now I have to contact a hundred landowners instead of one landowner. We have to look at some of the economies of scale. How many acres are we really trying to replant? Or is this more about numbers of landowners, getting people more involved? They're both great, both important, but they have different end goals. And you can see that there's a couple of other factors that are involved here as well. Related to reforestation, we do have some good statistics that are out there. These are stats for the Southern US and we can look at how many acres of forest land are being planted. This is across all ownerships, but we can see the generally high trends. Some of those really strong peaks are related to various programs like CRP when those are go going full bore. Um, but otherwise we can see that on an annual basis, there are a massive number of acres being replanted. Uh, and again, this is just for the Southern US. I wanna shift a little bit and talk about some more general findings that we have about landowner behavior. What I was showing before is really specific towards those topics I was mentioning. So about afforestation, reforestation. But we also have a lot richer data set if we're able to expand that. If we just wanna look at general inclinations towards various forest management activities, and hopefully these are good surrogates, or at least there's a lot of information that we can be providing. And for the two that I'm gonna be talking about, these are ones where we have um, some really nice lit reviews, some literature reviews that have been done, and we can say things across many, many studies. So the first one by Emily Silver and, and colleagues is looking at timber harvesting. And they looked at a large number of topics or large number of papers looking at this. This is a favorite of many of us who, have, who look at family forest owners. What are the impacts? What are the factors correlated with whether or not they're harvesting trees? One of the ones that we, we see that has a consistent and positive impact is the size of holdings. The greater the number of acres, the more likely they will be harvesting trees. Part of that is opportunity. There's just more acres, more likely trees will be mature. 
but there's also other factors. Um, the number of acres is highly correlated with stuff related to, for example, management intentions. Uh, we could see a number of other factors that are highly, that are positively correlated. So stuff related to stumpage prices, that makes sense. What's interesting with stumpage prices, it's not necessarily that the landowners are getting a higher value from the land, but there are more procurement foresters or other people out there who are soliciting um, more, more wood to come off the land. As I was mentioning before, a lot of landowners are only harvesting once or twice during their tenure, and a lot of landowners don't use foresters, so they don't necessarily know what the, the stumpage values are. Depends on who they are and where they are, but um, overall, we do see a lot of that. Um, more educated they are, the more likely they tend to be uh, harvesting, whether or not they have professional assistance, land tenure, whether or not they have a management of plan, and you can see a number of other factors as well. There are some factors that are negatively correlated, so such as whether they're absentee landowner and whether they are older. And then there's some that we're seeing is mixed. This might have to do with the particulars of the study. So uh, what is their overall income or whether or not they are a farmer? Or sometimes this is just a fact, um, depends on specific circumstances. So that's looking at timber harvesting. This is a little bit older of a publication, but um, this one from Beach et al. from 05, looking at reforestation, and we could see what some of the factors are. A number of these are, if not identical, at least related to some of the factors that we were seeing in the previous slide. So overall stumpage prices, or more specifically, they tend to look at saw log prices or pulpwood prices. Um, we see those as positive, planting costs being negative. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then a number of other factors that are mixed as well. Um, and then all the way down at the bottom, we can see that size of holding, again, has that positive influence. So I just want to touch on landowner behavior models just real quickly. Uh, not to get into a lecture about some of the theoretical models that we use for landowner change behavior. If anybody's interested in that, though, I'd be more than happy to um, pontificate on that or even better over a couple of beverages or two. Um, great topics, important topics. But what are one, the theoretical models that we use to try to understand how landowners change their behaviors. And then two, what are some of those levers that we have that we can actually start to change that we can use? So we have a number of incentive programs that are out there. That's what some of those other, some of those previous literature that I was showing is looking at do incentive programs work? In some circumstances, they certainly do. CRP has a really strong and rich um, background of having this additive effect. Some other incentive programs, they are having a little bit more of a mixed bag. Um, so for example, some of the programs that are looking that are providing technical assistance to landowners, a lot of the landowners were most likely going to do those activities otherwise. Granted, the technical assistance will help them do it better and help them do it more, but it's not necessarily a behavior change. So we need to be, we want to be thinking through that. There's a lot of tax programs that are either on the books or that are being proposed and thinking about how those will influence landowners. Again, it's going to vary by segment. For all landowners, they are paying property taxes uh, on their forest land, except for parts of Alaska, but everywhere else. Um, they are paying property taxes and they're paying it on an annual basis. So that is something that will resonate with them. Income taxes, not necessarily. Um, income taxes is going to be based on earn, earnings that you have. And if you're not actively um, receiving money from your land, that may not be relevant to you. And so thinking about how important some of those programs are to landowners can be mixed. And then there have been a lot of discussions related to inheritance taxes. Right now, the threshold for inheritance taxes is a little bit north of 10 million per individual, 20 million per couple, and that's going up every year. The number of family forest owners who would actually qualify, <coughs> excuse me, for that is relatively small. Granted, some of those who will um, be hit by those taxes, they own a lot of land. Um, and so, you know, that can be important, again, for a certain segment. But for a lot of those people, they do realize that there are vehicles out there for help them to navigate some of those. Uh, we have a number of regulations that are on the books, depending on where you are. Um, we might have um, regulatory best management practices. We might have voluntary best management practices. And there's a, um, a rich literature out there, or maybe not rich, but there's a literature out there looking at the effectiveness of those. 
We have conservation easements is another tool. And then as before, I was talking about technical assistance. We have plenty of theoretical approaches that are out there, but actually within this literature, not a whole lot that we've been using. Um, and so a lot of us come from more of a forestry background than a social, sociological or psychological background. And I think we could be doing a lot more with that. And then another thing I can think, I think we could be doing a lot more is something called evidence-based practices. This is what the medical literature does. Um, we can pontificate about what works and what doesn't work, but in the medical literature, when they are literally making life or death decisions, this is the gold standard, evidence-based practices. And we can start to adopt more of these methodologies when we are making decisions about programs within forestry. Granted, we don't always have enough information. That's true in the medical literature as well, um, but we need to be making these decisions. And this can also help, to dir help direct where future research is going. So what I'd like to do now is shift over into a analysis that I prepared for today using the National Woodland Donor Survey. As was mentioned before, this is the program that I have the honor of being in charge of. And so it is something that I am very familiar with, um, something that I think is a really rich data set and we can ask lots of questions about. The National Woodland Donor Survey is part of the USDA Forest Services Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. The General Forest Inventory Analysis Program has over 300,000 per permanent inventory plots, plots across the United States. And so basically, instead of counting trees, we count landowners is basically what we do. Um, you know, we go a little bit deeper. We try to understand their attitudes and behaviors. But what's really important, it's a random set of landowners that we're trying to contact across the United States. So we get an unbiased sample of these people. It's an area-based sample. That's how we get our random sample. Uh, we go through a lot of perturbations to try and get our cooperation rates up as high as possible, our biases as minimized as possible. And overall, things are pretty good. Um, for the last set of data, the stuff that I'm gonna be using here came out in 2018. That is one of many tables that we recently published in a general technical report. Um, and so, but based on roughly 10,000 responses of family forest owners. And so I'd encourage people who are interested in the data, um, there's a URL there, contact me. I'd be happy to provide additional information. We provide summaries at the national, regional, state level. We have, for every state, we have it divided by um, different size categories, um, or at least at the regional and national scales, we have some sample size issues. But at least for every state, we have summaries for family forest owners with 10 or more acres. We have our general tables, but we also have two page summaries that are available that we just recently um, got put onto our website. So really happy and getting all that information out. And also the book that Marvin was talking about before is another example of us trying to get the data out. What I'm gonna be showing in just a couple of minutes is analysis I put together based on the National Woodland Owner Survey. And I wanted to take a slightly different look at what we are thinking about um, this topic about who's most likely to be aforesting or who's most likely to be participating in a lot of these programs. I went through the data that we have available and the summary that I'm gonna be showing, the analysis I'm gonna be showing is only for landowners who have 10 or more acres of forest land and landowners who only have 10 or more acres of non-forest land as well. Um, so that there's some potential for afforestation on here. I will be presenting what's called a classification tree, often called CART or um, a partitioning model. And so that's an example over on the right-hand side. I will step through that in just a minute. And what I was trying to model is what are the factors that are influencing whether or not somebody is what I'd call an active landowner, looking at both past activities and future activities. And I divided them landowners up into three categories for both past and future. Um, and so what they, we have are low activity landowners. In the past five years, they have done none of the activities that we surveyed. I'll mention what those are in a minute. If they've done one or two activities, they got classified as medium. And if they did three or more, they got classified as large. I'll show that general distribution. We can cut the data lots of different ways, but for today's analysis, that's what I did. And I wanted to know what is associated with these. And to a certain extent, this is 
confirmation of some of the other publications that I was showing earlier. But hopefully this is adding um, some new light to it. And so those are some of the independent variables that went into it. With this modeling approach, it will go through and pick what are the best variables and the other ones will basically not be used at all in those models. And I think that's what's important about the modeling that I will present in a minute. But before I get there, I just wanted to provide some general findings from the 2018 National Woodland Donor Survey for those who may not be familiar with it or just interested in some of the more general pieces that are out there. And so the first thing that if I could get across to everyone is just who owns the land. Again, family forest owners own more land across the U.S. than any other group. So I think that is just hugely important. Size of forest holdings matters. Whether you own 10 acres or 100 acres, different things you can do with those lands. And again, those size of holdings are just hugely correlated with a number of other factors. Why do most landowners own it? It's related to the amenity values, so such as beauty and wildlife. And that's really important when we're trying to communicate with these people and trying to understand what motivates them. Do they want to manage or not manage? Most landowners are okay with active management and most think it's appropriate, but not everybody knows how to do that or they might be scared of it, uh, worried about it. And so that's one of those places where the forestry community, if we could be talking with a unified, unified voice, providing simple messages um, in the right manner at the right time, we can really make some headway in some of these, um, in some of these directions. One thing is important is again, related to the segmentation. And so thinking through who are these landowners? In general, they tend to be older white males, or at least that's who the primary decision makers are. But in most circumstances, these lands are owned by a man and a woman. And so it can be equally important to make sure that we are communicating with the full couple or making sure that we have programming that's available for both men and women. And there's some fantastic programs out there related to women owning woods. Uh, in my opinion, knowledge is power. And this is one of those directions that would be great to head in. Again, as I was mentioning before, these are private lands. And so it's important to make sure that they have information about what their options are. Two different ways that we can look at these statistics, looking at them in terms of size of holdings, which is in the red, or in terms of ownerships, we could see very different distributions. And what is important depends on what we are trying to do out there. Do we wanna to talk to more people? or have a bigger impact on the landscape or do both. And we can definitely slice and dice the data different ways. Again, just looking at reasons for owning, we can see that there are a lot of different reasons. Most people are multiple objective owners and most of them are related to um, amenity values. This is from a publication that came out earlier this year, looking at the difference or the relationship between size of holdings and various factors. And we can see that there are really strong relationships between size of holdings and a number of these factors. Some of these attributes are high across the board. Some of them um, depends on what the size of holdings are. And so this could be one of those ways that we can be segmenting landowners. Just figuring out what their size of holdings will go a far way. This is the analysis I wanted to present and I'll try to get through this fairly quickly given the amount of time that we have. Um, so are landowners active or not? So the salmon colored bars, um, this is looking at future activities and then the teal, not quite sure what color that is. Um, the greenish color is looking at past activities. How many activities have they done on their land? This is just looking at percentage of respondents. We could see that it's roughly 15% of the respondents to the National Wilderness Owner Survey have done nothing in the previous five years or plan to do it in the next five years. And then you could see what the distribution is going out. There are a number of landowners who are super active um, and then a number who are sort of somewhere in between. I think that's all important. These are the activities that we are querying about. So have they done a personal harvest? Meaning are they harvesting usually for firewood or something like that? The most common activity in the past five years. A lot of people are also doing activities related to wildlife enhancement. And what's really interesting with that one, there's even more people who are interested in doing that in the future. And then the third most common is harvesting for sale. And it's also important to think that this is only a five year time span. A lot of these landowners are not gonna be doing this on a regular basis. So there are a lot of um, fairly active landowners on the landscape, which is really important. So here's the first of the two decision trees I wanted to present. I wanted, again, I wanted to be able to predict or at least see what's correlated with whether or not landowners are low, medium or high in terms of activity levels. 
And what we can see are the greatest predictors of that is first of off, have they received advice? Have they received professional or just advice in general in the last five years? If yes, the probability that they are a highly active landowner is 70%. One thing that I find really important about that is when we start thinking about how we want to implement these programs, maybe we want to look at the low hanging fruit. These are the people we already know. Granted, if we want to get a behavioral change, maybe that's not the group of people we want. But if these people are the ones who are most likely to be aforesting, reforesting, and there's enough of them to have that massive change that we're looking for, that's great. If not, we want to go down a different one of these pathways. And what's interesting, if we start looking on the left-hand side, we could see what some of the other variables are that start separating landowners. It's whether or not firewood is an important objective to them. Uh, if it is, they are more likely to be a medium or high active landowner, whether or not recreation is important to them, and then whether or not invasives is a important concern to them. And so these are interesting touch points for them that we, at least I, before I ran these analyses, would not necessarily be thinking about ways of segmenting or understanding these landowners. I found this hugely interesting. And this is looking at future activities and we see very similar patterns. Granted, past and future activities are highly correlated with each other. They're not independent from each other. But um, I think that this is showing a lot of similarities and support for both of those. So let me finish up with a few next steps and then we will uh, hopefully have a few minutes for questions and answers. There's a lot of work that's already been out there. And so I think we need to be doing more work there. There's definitely enough work um, that's been published in the policy realm or in the realm related to carbon markets that really needs to be synthesized. Um, there's some work that's been synthesized in some of those publications, but there's more that definitely can be done. I think that there needs to be more dialogues between those who are on the research side and those who are on the policy side. Otherwise, we both get siloed. We're both doing great work. We all have great intentions, but we need to make sure that we are using our resources wisely. I'm a researcher, so obviously I'm gonna say more research is needed. I will always say that, but in particular related to all land. So thinking about all of the land that individuals own, I think is really important. Um, if we are interested in afforestation, we need more information specifically on that. And then related to the dialogues, we need to be making sure that we are testing current policies. The other information is important, but we could be doing more. And then related to what I was presenting here, uh, I think it was interesting. I think it was strong, but there's definitely a lot more that could be done with that. So with that, Marvin, uh, I think I have about five. Oh, no, I thought I had five. I have a few minutes left. Uh, if there's some questions, I'd love to take them. Sure, Brett, thanks. And uh, if you have a question, I'd also point out that uh, we, I have invited Dr. Tamara Cushing to participate in this session. Tamara's a uh, professor at Oregon State University with a lot of experience in forest taxation. She helped me quite a bit uh, recently on some work I was doing for NASF in that regard and uh, a lot of experience just with private landowners. So if you have any questions, we can go, uh, you know, a little bit longer than, than the uh, 10 to 10 before the hour and just put them in the chat box and we'll try to address them. Well, Brent, you must have answered everybody's questions already, I guess. Um, if there are none, Tammy, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I will tell you uh, just on the on the tax front, I had some interesting conversations. I, I see at least one person from AFF is on here. Uh, today was part of the fly-in and um, sitting in and talking to the legislators uh, about some of the, the asks and carbon was one of those conversations. So um, we talked about carbon, we talked about the trillion trees and maybe some tax incentives around some of those things. So just know they're asking. Um, one, the, the representative for, for uh, Oregon specifically wanted to know about with the Trillion Trees Act, what tax per, uh, incentives, what things we want in there related to taxes and forestry in that particular bill as it goes forward. So I thought that was really great that he was interested. Um, his main concern uh, is this whole estate tax. I know Brett talked about 
the estate tax threshold. A uh, big threat to it, of course, uh, with what Biden is potentially talking about, removing step up and basis, uh, and pair that with uh, an increase in capital gains rates. Uh, and that could be a really big blow. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tammy. Any other questions from the group? So Rachel Reyna says, my brain got stuck on the comment on landowners would have completed various practices, whether or not they had financial incentives. Did I hear that correctly? That is correct, Rachel. Um, and so, yeah, there's a number of studies that have been done out there specifically looking at what is the behavioral change related to a number of the programs that are out there. And so through qualitative work, um, a lot of it's through qualitative work because we're trying to understand why somebody's doing it. And that can be very hard through quantitative where we just get sort of correlations. But asking landowners who have enrolled in a program or done something, and then you know, basically asking them, would you have done that otherwise? And a lot of them say, yeah, I was thinking about doing this otherwise. Um, but because I received this cost share or I saw this cost share, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Let me do it. Let me get paid for it. That's great. They don't mind that. Uh, until some of them see what some of the strings are attached, then not everybody's quite as excited. Um, but they see that this is something that is available to them. Um, and they will see that um, this meshes well with what they're trying to do. Again, a lot of these people are probably doing it better and doing more of it. So it does have that positive, but it's not necessarily taking a landowner who was not thinking about it and converting them over into um, somebody who is doing that specific activity. Um, so we might want to think a little bit more about how some of these programs are being run to do more of that. Um, CRP is an exception to that. CRP, there definitely is a lot more people who are planting trees because of CRP than they would otherwise. Uh, I'd, on a practical basis, uh, on a, on a, out in the woods basis with the landowners, the data that Brett collects that says that very thing is what we hear from landowners on the ground. That you know we have these really active landowners that know that that pot of money exists, and so they go get that that money to help them do that. But they were going to do it anyway. Um, what I hear from some landowners who don't do it is a lack of trust uh, in going and getting that government money, and so that is what's stopping some people. Uh, I know that's true in the South. I even hear it out here in Oregon. But just Saturday, I was out with a landowner, and he was going to do those operations with or without the money but he knew how to utilize the programs to get the money. That is interesting. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions and we are a few minutes past the, the designated hour. Uh, Brett, thanks a bunch for doing this. Tammy, thanks for participating as well. Um, I hope everybody who's been on this meeting got a lot out of it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, well, we do have one more question here. I once heard that the two best predic predictors of a successful tree planting project are use of a consulting forester having a good weed control plan. Any comment? <laughs> uh, again, I'll go back to what I was saying before. I am more of a social scientist than I am of a, a biological scientist as much as I would like to be. Uh, I do have some background in field forestry, but that's not where I'm at anymore at this point. Um, but yeah, coming from forestry background, yeah, of course, always having a forester involved is great. Um, that doesn't always happen though. So we have to be thinking about that. Um, and yeah, um, the part about weed control kind of depends on where you are across the country, but that can be a, a huge issue that will make, make or break a, uh, a successful program. We've got one, one last question here. Um, this is from one of my bosses, Greg Joston in South Carolina, so we're going to get that one in. But it says, uh, does it follow that the technical assistance is more important than the cost share assistance, given the things we've been hearing here? Yeah, that's a great question, Greg. Um, and so, um, yeah, overall, I would say yes. Um, and also depends on what you consider what technical assistance is. There's just a bunch of sort of definitions that are out there. I don't know if it has to do with what my background is, but I'm a huge um, believer in education and information. Granted, us as adults, we don't like to be educated. 
Um, so that's so we have to be careful when we're providing information. But you know, these landowners, they're smart. They have lots of information. But a lot of these are looking, a lot of these landowners are looking for more information. So how can we get them more information from trusted sources? Um, very similar to some of the presentations we were hearing from before. But you know, they're different target audiences. We want to make sure they're getting it from trusted sources. A lot of these landowners, they do still trust the government agencies for it. Um, this technical information, be it an extension agent, be it somebody who works with a state forestry agency. Granted, depends on the state. It will definitely vary. Um, but getting them that information, I think, can be really important. And so, yeah, that technical assistance, um, some of that will also be through peer-to-peer -peer programs. So master forest owner program is another great way of going about that, Greg. We've seen really good results. Thanks, I agree. I agree. I think technical assistance is still very, very important. Even though all this stuff is on the internet, they don't know how to discern what's good from what's not good. Um, and I think that's where our programs come into play from extension from state agencies is to kind of guide them to what is technically correct information. And then of course, then they hear about the cost share. So uh, I do think one feeds the other, but it's easy for them to get technical assistance, especially since it's usually free. Great. I'm gonna, gonna stop things here. Um, Rick Cantrell pointed out I called South Dakota, South Carolina. Sorry about that, Greg, but uh, it's getting to be towards the end of the day. Um, again, Brett and Tammy both thank you a great deal for participating in this. And thanks for all of you who have sat in and listened carefully and asked good questions. Um, have a good rest of the day.